to discuss the various uh, secondary IOL techniques uh, which are used for management of aphakia in the absence of capsular support, the past, present and future of secondary IOLs, uh, the various indications, contraindications and the prerequisites, the right methodology to perform a technique complications and their management. Uh, so why we decided to uh, choose this topic for discussion today uh, is because I think uh, all the surgeons who are doing cataract surgery can relate with this topic very well. Uh, uh, doesn't matter if they are experienced or surgeons in training and especially the young ophthalmologists uh, would uh, certainly benefit a lot from, from all the discussions because uh, uh, they need this knowledge uh, about management of aphakia with various lenses and uh, technologies to become confident and complete cataract surgeons. So um, it gives me immense pleasure to welcome uh, my teacher and mentor, Dr. Shri Ganesh, uh, who would be the main speaker and the master coach of this master class. And uh, uh, he certainly doesn't need any introduction. He's a very prolific cataract and refractive surgeon. Uh, and a very popular uh, ophthalmologist, uh, not just in India, uh, all across the world. Uh, he is the uh, CMD of uh, uh, Netradhama Group of Eye Hospitals and um, has uh, been running a very successful FACO and refractive fellowship program uh, since the past 15 years or so and has uh, trained over 160 fellows and the students uh, and we also have a DNB uh, program. Um, uh, Dr. Ganesh has conducted uh, uh, many international uh, instruction courses on complex uh, cataract surgeries and um, uh, also has uh, himself performed over one lakh uh, cataract surgery procedures which speaks volumes about his expertise and experience in this field. Uh, he's uh, a great uh, surgeon of course we know uh, but apart from that he's a wonderful human being and a great innovator, a great mentor and teacher. Uh, he has innovated a lot of uh, new and path-breaking techniques and uh, technologies. He's got, uh, he's innovated some lenses. So um, uh, I'm sure uh, the whole uh, audience is going to benefit a lot from his uh, uh, experience, uh, which he's going to share today. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dinesh, for uh, uh, agreeing to be part of this webinar and uh, uh, contributing. Uh, uh, we welcome you, sir. And uh, thank you. And I also uh, welcome. Um, uh, Dr. Gaurav Lutra. He again does not need any introduction. He is the director of uh, Drishti Eye Hospitals and is a very uh, popular uh, ophthalmologist. Uh, he is uh, well known for his surgical skills which he has been displaying, displaying in various live surgery events uh, across a uh, uh, lot of conferences but these days because conferences are not happening we see him all around. Uh, in uh, conducting a lot of webinars and sharing his expertise and experience with uh, all the delegates and um, uh, everyone. So I think it's a wonderful thing, uh, Dr. Gaurav, which you're doing. Uh, thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Uh, very warm welcome to you, sir. Thank, thanks, uh, Sheetal, and thanks, Sri, for inviting me. So uh, continue. Yeah, sure, sure. And, uh, you know, so I'm really uh, excited to see the topic that uh, Dr. Sri Ganesh has chosen today and, uh, you know, him being uh, an expert at almost all these techniques of uh, secondary lens fixation. I think uh, it's, uh, you know, very appropriate and the topic is very nice because almost all of us uh, come across these uh, situations uh, where uh, we are stuck with the uh, options of and you know the, there are several choices so dr ganesh is going to lead us through you know starting from iris fixation techniques going on to scleral fixation techniques and all the techniques that we can uh, you know come across from glue dial to sutureless uh, fixation and uh, i think we will take questions so there is an option on the link if you are logged into that coach uh, link we will be also streaming live on facebook on the netradhama page i think Yet, uh, you know, you can send in your questions and me and uh, Sheetal will be looking up at questions and taking them in between uh, when Dr. Ganesh takes a break from, you know, various techniques. So I think I'm really looking forward. Dr. Sh Shri Ganesh, uh, please go ahead and uh, show us how, you know, all these things and, uh, you know, your brilliant surgeries uh, looking forward. Let's see. Thank you, Gaurav. And uh, good evening, dear friends and colleagues. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, speaking to you on uh, secondary IOL uh, techniques. And uh, let me just start sharing my screen now. So, secondary IOLs is a very uh, important talk, 
topic because many a time we have to deal with patients uh, who are aphasic without capsula bag support and uh, then we need to know what our options are and how we are going to go about what are the indications what are the various techniques um, i do not have any financial disclosure uh, though i have innovated a few techniques which i'll be speaking about so if a care without capsular support is uh, a frequent uh, a subject for frequent debate uh, there are many techniques uh, available but no consensus on the ideal method with advances in surgical devices iol models suture materials surgeons have multiple options now to tackle aphasia without adequate capsular support but the whole challenge is to find a technique which is very easy which is quick to perform and also has long term stability with very low complication rates the first secondary iols uh, which were available were the anterior chamber iols uh, it's a very quick and easy option but it is not preferred nowadays because of the considerable risk of angle damage endothelial cell decomposition um and uh, compared to the iris and scleral haptic fixated iols you can have various complications commonly endothelial cell loss bullous keratopathy ugh syndrome chronic pain and tenderness if you have an oversized uh, lens glaucoma and uh, uveitis persistent uveitis pigment deposition and cystoid macular edema uh, partial capture of the iol like you see in this figure so these are all uh, anterior synecae these are all issues and uh, by and large anterior chamber lens uh, have been given up and have become obsolete the most popular uh, was the kelman multiflex lens in the kelman multiflex lens but you have various designs uh, which were available and uh, of course it becomes in sizes so you have to measure the limbus to limbus and then use the ideal size to reduce the risk of these complications but uh, it's years since i have implanted a uh, anterior chamber lens the next technique available is iris fixation so iris fixation of iols can either be sutured fixation or a uh, clipped lens so coming to suture fixation of iols uh, you can uh, suture fixate either a three piece iol injected through a 3 or 3.5 mm corneal incision or you can also suture fixate a pmma lens uh, here a sepsis sliding knot with uh, either 9o or 10o proline is used to secure the haptics to the peripheral mid peripheral iris and uh, the advantage of this technique is if you already have a lens um, which is dislocated and you want to fixate the same lens then uh, irrespective of whether it's a pmma lens or a three piece lens uh you can fixate it single piece lenses uh, are not ideal for uh, suturing because uh, they have uh, very sharp edges at the haptic and they can cause iris chafing uh, persistent uveitis and uh, pigment dispersion so let us look at a video this is a video from sam masket and uh, this is quite an old video you can see that he is using the holder folder uh technique and then uh, this is a three piece lens he releases the lens so that the haptics go underneath the iris so you'll have to see that the haptics are under the iris and the optic is in front you'll have to constrict the pupil and then you use uh, a curved needle with tenoproline and pass it through the cornea through the iris uh, underneath the haptic and then you have two side ports through which you bring out these uh, sutures so once you bring out the sutures then you apply a sepsis knot you can also use the technique of uh, fourth row uh, technique uh, described by amar agarwal and otherwise you can use the sepsis knot which basically slips through and uh, you can tighten the suture the same thing is done on the opposite side and the suture is cut via the main incision via micro forceps and then you can uh, just uh, put the optic behind the iris do an irrigation aspiration and if required uh, suture the main incision so this is uh, the technique ideal for uh, three piece uh, lenses or pmma lenses
the advantages of iris suturing of an iul uh, compared to scleral fixation is that there is no externalization of the sutures there is a reduced risk of endophthalmitis it preserves the conjunctiva and is beneficial in glaucoma patients because you are not reflecting the conjunctiva and if they need a filtering surgery later on you can perform that coming to the iris clip lenses uh, these were first in, introduced by jan vers in 1972 uh, from netherlands uh, first uh, implanted the lens into the anterior chamber and clipped it to the anterior surface of the iris and he, he found that the technique was safe and provided uh, clinical results and he popularized this technique and quite a few of them uh, took up these uh, this uh, technique and in india uh, professor daljit singh uh, he promoted this uh, and did quite a few cases the advantages is uh, a very fast surgery compared to iris sutured or scleral fixated iuls so the artisan uh, afk iul uh, is made by optic and it's a single piece biconvex pmma iul uh, nowadays indian companies also make it but mainly we use it for retrofixation um the fake kiwl the same optic makes also fake kiwls which were marketed by uh, amo previously the artisan uh, fake kiwl but this is the a fake kiwl for secondary implantation so it is single piece biconvex pmma iwl the overall length is 8.5 mm and uh, it has the height vault height is 1.04 mm it's got a 5.4 5.5 mm optical zone the manufacturer's uh, a constant for implantation above the iris is 115 for ultrasound biometry and 115.7 for optical biometry and you can see this is the lens made of pmm and uh, it has got two gaps in the haptic through which you will have to enclavate the iris tissue with these tips by Okay. Okay. So, coming to the surgery planning and technique, the ideal candidate for an artisan IUL is one who has adequate iris stroma. The pupil size should be about five millimeters or less. If you have a very large pupil which does not constrict, then it is not ideal. And you, the pupil should be centered. Um, if there are small iris defects. that do not preclude stable iul implantation and keratopia uh, where the optic can cover the uh, pupil you can still go ahead and do it if you have iris defects uh, from trauma or uh, uh, surgical sector iridectomy then you can't really use these lenses uh, if you have uh, also persistent uveitis or a large iris defect then you cannot use these lenses this is a video of uh, the implantation this is from uh, my colleague uh, dr ik ahmed you can see that uh, he has put in viscoelastic and then um, he's doing a vitrectomy clearing the vitreous it's very important that they clear any vitreous you can also use transural non using transural non and to see that there is no vitreous in the anterior uh, chamber and the uh, iris plane the pupil is constricted with uh, myocol or pilocarpin and the clear cornea wound is extended to 5.5 mm that is the artisan lens which is introduced and then it can be either rotated or sutured i mean clipped in this fashion uh, it is better to close the wound so that you have a good uh, chamber and then you hold the lens with forceps and then you can pull the iris tissue through the clip so that's what he is doing here pull it through the clip so that you have an adequate enclavation yeah, there is already a pre existing iridectomy otherwise uh, you can do an iridectomy and you can see that the pupil is quite round and well centered and then um the side port is closed and the main incision is closed so this is a uh, iris clip lens but uh, it's an anterior iris clip lens and this technique uh, basically uh is not very popular now for uh, various reasons uh the main being uh, endothelial cell loss 
it can it is reported that the endothelial cell loss uh, can be as high as 10 to 13% at 3 to 4 years post op uh, and particularly in patients with uh, narrow anterior chambers so by and large uh, anterior fixation has been given up what is preferred now is a retropupillary uh, fixation where the lens is clipped to the posterior surface of the iris though it's a little bit of a blind technique a constant of 116.8 is used for retrofixation with uh, ultrasound biometry and 116.9 for optical biometry and uh, retrofixation has uh, shown to have lower risk of endothelial cell loss while providing uh, predictable uh, clinical outcomes oh, sorry these slides are jumping let me just So let's watch a video. And this was a patient that I had operated uh, many years ago uh, who came with a dislocation of uh, lens with a pupillary capture. You can see this is the Sion Pharmacia silicon lens with PVDF uh, haptic. And one of the haptics along with the bag has come anteriorly. Here I'm planning to do a scleral tunnel. So I reflect the conventiva. And uh, that's creation of a 5.5 5 to 5.5 mm scleral tunnel. When I make two side ports at uh, 3 o'clock and 9 o'clock position, you can make the side ports also at uh, 4 o'clock and 2 o'clock position if you're using an enclavation needle. But here I plan to use forceps. That's entry into the anterior chamber. And once I enter into the anterior chamber, I extend the incision scleral tunnel to 5.5 millimeters. Then I put in viscoelastic, and then you can see that the haptic is uh, in, in the AC, and you can see the zonules are very weak. I use a dialer to just pull on the lens. There is some amount of sinicia there, which I'm releasing. And you can see that the entire bag is uh, very weak. It's probably uh, pseudo exfoliation. And this patient uh, came after about 12 years with this condition. I, so the whole bag along with the lens is brought into the anterior chamber. And then I'm supporting it with the dialer so that it does not touch the end of the end. Then I just pull out the entire lens and the bag. You can see that's the lens and the bag which has come out. <laughs> And there's no vitreous loss as such. So if there is vitreous, then you have to do a bit anti vitrectomy. But if the anti hyaloid is intact, then there's no need to do a vitrectomy. This is the artisan lens. Uh, many of the Indian companies also make it you now. Biotech, Iocare, Excel. So I'm rotating the lens uh, horizontally. Ideally, the pupil should be around four millimeters. If you have a large pupil, then you can get ovalization. So constrict the pupil. This is a uh, forceps. I have a uh, forceps with the lock, which I have made. It's available with Epsilon. So you will have to put in the lens under the iris and that's enclavation through the side port. You see that adequate tissue is enclaved. Then you change hands. Grasp the forceps with the left hand, get hold of the body of the lens, and put the haptic under the iris. And with your right hand, then you can use either a cannula or these fine forceps to just enclave it. Push down, and you have a nice knuckle of iris which is enclavated, and the lens is very stable. And you, because it's a scleral tunnel, you don't have to suture. Um, you can do an iridectomy, but because the lens has a posterior offset, even if you don't do an iridectomy, the chance of uh, pupillary block is very rare. You can see the post-op picture. The advantages of the retrofixation is uh, better endothelial safety. It's a very fast and easy procedure to do. You can even do it under topical anesthesia with subconjunctival uh, injection. So I just give a small subconjunctival anesthesia uh, injection and uh, reflect the conjunctiva and we can make a 
sternum. You can also do it uh, through clear cornea, but you will have to suture the wound because it will be a five millimeter uh, clear corneal incision. It's uh, very fast. Technically, it is quite easy. It's probably the easiest and fastest uh, secondary IUL procedure. And uh, a lot of people uh, use it routinely. The disadvantages is uh, because of the larger in incision, it induces astigmatism. Um, you'll have to make an incision of around 5.5 millimeters. And it cannot be used in patients who have iris defects or in patients who have uveitis. You can also have complications, long-term complications with retrofixated IOs. You can have hyphema, you can have recurrent iritis, you can have secondary glaucoma, cystoid macular edema, you can have disenclavation of the haptics from the iris, and sometimes over a period of time, there is uh, the iris, uh, there's loss of iris trauma, and uh, you can see that uh, the whole lens kind of decenters. So that is something also that can happen. Especially if uh, post traumatic, if the iris tissue is not very viable, it's not advised to use this. Uh, we published our results in the Open Journal of Ophthalmology. Uh, the long term uh, clinical and visual outcomes of uh, retro fixated iris claw lens in complicated cases. And we had two groups one where the uh, standalone uh, retro fixated IULs were put in, and the others in combined, in combination with. Uh, VR surgery or uh, glaucoma procedures. And uh, we studied uh, 100 uh, eyes over eight years. And uh, we found that uh, sorry about that. So we found that uh, visual outcome was fairly good, but there was a higher rate of uh, complications like. Uh, Secondary glaucoma, disenclavation of the secondary glaucoma in 8%, disenclavation of the haptic in 4%, subluxation of the lens in about 1%. And uh, there are also other studies. The Orlini and uh, group published uh, their results, retrospective analysis in BMC ophthalmology, where they observed 320 eyes over uh, five years. and uh, 3% of cases of disenclavation and one lens uh, dislocated completely uh, into the uh, posterior segment and uh, one retinal detachment and three cases of CME. But this, these, their results are comparatively better. If you, the other group uh, that published in the Journal of uh, cataract and refractive surgery, uh, they looked at 137 eyes uh, for five years for uh, mean follow-up of five months. And then they had CME in 12 eyes, 8.7%, endophthalmitis in one eye, hyphema in three, uh, which is 2.1%, chronic uveitis recurring, uh, requiring IUL removal in one, and disenclavation in 12. So the um, CME uh, has been reported to be up to 33% and retinal detachment up to 8.2%. IOL dislocation in 6.3% and suture breakage in 27% with scleral fixated uh, IOL, transcleral uh, sutured IOL. So compared to transcleral sutured IOL, they said that the complications were less with iris retrofixation. So this is the first section where we have dealt with the anterior chamber and iris central fixation. So if there are any questions, I think we can stop and uh, take them now before going in uh, to the scleral fixated areas. Yeah, that's nice. Uh, Shriganesh, you covered uh, everything so well. And uh, I think uh, the iris uh, switched was uh, lenses were done so elegantly, the posterior one. The, uh, if you'll just stop sharing your slideshow, then maybe you know we can uh, have all all of us be visible. Yeah, great. So uh, I, you know, there were questions. One question which came up was uh, by one Dr. Kalpana. She is asking that uh, when doing uh, any kind of uh, IL fixation in eyes which are single chamber, which are basically opaque, uh, if you are using a lot of viscoelastic, when there is a lot of hypotony, 
how do you ensure that later on that viscoelastic does not lead to secondary glaucoma because you know much of it will go in a vitrectomized eye especially so how do we ensure that basically you will have to use visco what i do nowadays is i use a, a fast plana cannula trocar cannula and with that i have a fluid infusion going on so i hardly use any viscoelastic and that maintains the chamber very well and that can be a solution and that's i will show that when i am doing the other techniques for iris retrofixation uh, you don't remove too much of the vitreous you're not going fast plana you don't remove too much of vitreous there may be some amount of vitreous uh, behind the lens or behind the iris uh, you will have to wash it out very gently but don't try to wash out too much otherwise the vitreous will come up and then uh, it you can uh, it can distort the pupil uh, the vitreous can come into the wound you can have pu peaking of the uh, pupil so some amount of visco if it is a dispersive viscoelastic left behind uh, is not a problem you can put the patient on anti glaucoma medication as fizolamide and usually within 2 to 3 days the uh, iop kind of settles down wonderful and uh... Uh, there was one more question that uh, today because you know uh, even in your case you've kind of uh, moved on to the newer techniques which are sutureless uh, you know iol fixation techniques like the yamane or the other glue techniques and all which you will be talking about later so is there still any indication left for using these uh, you know either the retrofixated iris claw or the i retrofixated iris sutured lenses would you still use them in any particular indication over and above you know those uh, the newer techniques that you are proficient with uh yes uh, the uh, iris is retrofixated uh, uh, can be used because it, it's a very easy to perform and simple procedure very fast and uh, in cam cases generally we uh, do the iris retrofixated because many of the residents are very comfortable doing them uh, and it's quite easy and it's a fast technique and it is uh, fairly safe so it's still a lot of people do Uh, iris retrofixation i would not advise uh, anterior fixation of the claw lens because that can uh, have uh, serious complications like uh, endothelial loss and bullous keratopathy uh, for the sutured fixation of the lens uh, yes it has its place if you want to fixate the same lens uh, to the iris and then you have uh, a normal iris Uh, it can be done it can be done in conjunction with uh, the other techniques but it is not preferable because there is some amount of degradation of the suture especially if you are using tenoproline uh, after 5 or 6 years again you can have a dislocation of the lens so it's not ideal so these are techniques which we are avoiding uh, now using sutures and uh, fixating it to the iris but retrofixation still has its place and uh, i think a lot of uh, surgeons are still using uh, iris retrofixation for secondary eyes dr sheetal do you have any question yeah uh, yeah this is a uh, interesting question by dr kali shankar he wants to ask what is the method of disenclavation of retropupillary uh, iris uh, fixation lens if required so how do you disenclave if you want to explant the lens explanting the lens is a little tough because it is a blind technique so um basically what i do is uh, i dilate the pupil okay i dilate the pupil i go in with the forceps hold the optic and then from the side port i pass a very fine cannula underneath the pupil and underneath the haptic of the lens and then push up in the area of enclavation where you can see the knuckle of tissue which is depressed so you will have to go there and just then push up and then you can see that the knuckle of tissue just disappears it becomes black and the lens has become loose so then this is an indication that you have released the iris tissue don't try to push the lens down if you try to push the lens down then you can have iridodialysis so it's very important not to push the lens down trying to disenclavate it by just pushing it down that will not have it happen and you will uh, have an uh, iridodialysis so best is to go underneath with a fine cannula through the where you have the junction between the optic and haptic through a side port on the opposite side and then push up and then disenclavate so same thing is repeated on the opposite side um once you disenclavate you have to bring the haptic into the anterior chamber above the iris before going on to the other side so that you don't lose the lens and it does not fall back into the vitreous cavity 
There's another Fantastic. question: How do you calculate the IUL power in these cases? For the yeah, yeah, the company gives a, a constant, and I think the a constant is somewhere around one 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 six uh, for uh, these lenses. So you can use the a constant and then calculate uh, with uh, whatever formula you are using. Uh, Wonderful. I think uh, you know. Should we, uh, Doctor Sheetal? Should we go on because I think there's lots to cover, and we can always come yeah. back for more questions unless you have something really interesting. Yeah. Uh, no, because there's one question: advantages of scleral fixation. I think that Sarah has already. That we yeah. Uh, we will cover that. We'll go to scleral fixation next. Yes, sir. Perfect. I think we should go on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. And we'll keep taking questions. So please keep yeah. sending yeah, in your questions. Uh, we'll be happy to take them up. Up. Uh, Can you see my screen? Yes, yes, we can. Yes. Okay. So next, let's move on to options for scleral fixation of uh, IUL, and uh, basically, this scleral fixation also can be performed with or without sutures. And uh, the older uh, techniques were with suture, and uh, this was uh, most commonly approached as an uh, externo technique through the ciliary sulcus or pars plana. Using the corneal limbus as an external landmark, so you you mark and try to uh, fixate the suture about 1.8 millimeters from the limbus, and uh, scleral fixation uh, with suture uh, of IULs requires IULs with suture eyelets, which allows stable anchoring of sutures to the iris. The lenses uh, you can use are the Accuos Adapt, or you can use the Alcon uh, CZ70 PD. Um, the NST, uh, NST abortion norm lenses, or you can use the uh, PMMA lenses. A uh, lot of the Indian companies, I, I think almost all Indian companies make uh, PMMA lenses with uh, eyelets like uh, Biotech, Iocare, Apaswami, etc. And you can use these uh, PMMA lenses. The preferred sutures are either Ninoproline, uh, but again, Ninoproline uh, nowadays. Uh, uh you people are uh, not very comfortable using uh, proline because after some time the proline kind of degenerates and after about uh, 8 to 10 years uh, you can again have dislocation of these iuls so gortex uh, sutures uh, are being used So the technique is uh, that you. This is accomplished by threading sutures through the haptic eyelets, followed by insertion of the IUL into the posterior chamber. The sutures are then externalized through the sclera. Uh, ideally, about two one point seven to two millimeters from the limbus. You can use a twenty seven gauge needle to dock the. A suture needle, or you can use uh, intraocular forceps uh, through the sclera, very fine uh, 25 gauge uh, intraocular forceps to grasp the suture uh, through the pass planner. So let's look at uh, one of the videos. Uh, those are the uh, that's the conjunctiva being reflected at nine o'clock and three o'clock position, and then uh, it's cauterized. So you can either make scleral flaps, which were uh, the older technique, or you can make Hoffman's pocket. This is uh, a marker to see that you are diametrically opposite. And it marks the scleral flaps, and you can make the scleral flap with the present plane. So three o'clock, nine o'clock, the conjunctiva, conjunctiva. I mean, the scleral flaps are made after reflecting the conjunctiva. And then a scleral tunnel is made for the PMMA lens. Here, a trocar cannula is introduced. So most of these scleral fixated uh, techniques, uh, we prefer to use a trocar cannula. The incision is uh, widened to six millimeters. This is a nanoproline, which is uh, used. And then there's a 26 gauge needle, which is passed. Uh, and then it is railroaded through. And then again, it is uh, the other side, the other needle is again 
passed and railroaded through the 26 gauge needle and then once that is done then with the dialer these uh, the sutures are brought out and then cut then they are threaded through the eyelet of the PMMA lens and then sutured so once it is sutured then the lens is introduced under the iris very gently you should be very careful because these haptics have a higher tendency to break so i prefer to kind of dial in the trailing uh, haptic and then position them and then you can pull on these sutures so that it is quite tight and then you do a triple throw knot lock knot and you can see that the lens is fairly well centered and then if uh, you feel that the tunnel is not holding very well it is better to suture it in a vitrectomized eye especially i prefer to always suture the spiral tunnel and then you can either use glue or you can apply sutures to the spiral flaps So the suturing of the spiral flaps and then you can remove your trocar cannula if it's leaking then you may have to suture it and that's the end of the procedure the sutured uh, spiral fixated iuls uh, okay this is another interesting case of a subluxated bag with the ctr this was a pseudo exfoliation high myope uh, subluxated uh, you can see the whole bag with the CTR. I had put in a CTR and 10 years later, this was a toric IUL, an Alcon toric IUL. 10 years later, he came back like this, uh, complaining of decreased vision. So here, uh, there is a CTR and also you can see this is an Alcon lens. The Alcon lens has like a slight bulb at the end of the haptic. So that's an advantage here. I've uh, made this clearal flap. I'm passing a nano proline i pass it just through the capsular bag it's fibros there at the area where the haptic end is and again pass it through the side port on the opposite side bring it out through the little bed there so essentially i have looped the suture through the haptic and the CTR, okay, and then I tighten the suture. The same thing on the opposite side. I do the same thing on the opposite side. That is the uh, closure of the, so the opposite side again. Uh, speed of flat make a side port position pass the nanoproline you can see that i pass it underneath the ctr and the haptic railroad it into a 26 gauge needle through the side port again pass it in front railroad it to a 26 gauge needle slightly away from the initial suture track the advantage is because of the fibrosis and also the bulbous end of the haptic it does not cut through and you can see that i have centered it well and then uh, i tighten the suture so the whole CPR bag IUL complex, you can see that it's a toric because of the markings and I've kind of aligned it so that the marks are, it was at 0, 180 degrees, so it's aligned here. And then I'm putting glue, closing the flap and glue for the conventive walls. And this patient did very well. 
I did a small iridectomy with the vitrector to prevent any pupillary block because of movement of the eye. And that was the post-op. This patient had 6-9 uncorrected vision. So coming to the pros and cons of the uh, suture fixated uh, SFI wells, the pros are uh, reduced risk of uh, corneal decomposition because it's behind the iris. Uh, there is no uh, risk of peripheral anterior sinicae. Secondary glaucoma, again, is not very common. Angle closure, uh, secondary glaucoma, because you're positioning the lens away from the anterior segment structures. The drawbacks are suture erosion and breakage. So this usually happens over five to ten years and it's better to use gotex uh, nowadays if you want to do a sutured eye well there's also a risk of exposure of the suture knot if you are not buried it properly and you will also have to dissect the conjunctiva and do a sclerotomy there can be leakage hypotony and you will have to make a slightly larger scleral incision and you may have to suture it the other disadvantage is the uh, yo-yoing which can happen where basically the lens tilts and yo-yos so uh, the vision is uh, very unstable and it fluctuates so this is one of the problems with uh, sutured SFIOLs. So coming to the sutureless SFIOL techniques, uh, they are the newer techniques which have reduced uh, suture related complications and they can be performed uh, to a smaller incision or uh, clear corneal incisions. It's less invasive. Technically, uh, it's less easier and less cumbersome than sutured fixated uh, SFIOLs, but uh, it needs some amount of uh, skill. So the first uh, technique uh, is glued eye wells. Uh, so this was introduced by Professor Amar Agarwal, and he built on the earlier work, work by uh, Gabor Shariat. Um, and he first published the glued IOL technique in 2008 and has been doing it and demonstrating it in all the conferences. Uh, here, the surgeon uses forceps to place the lens haptic inside scleral tunnels located under the scleral flaps. The flaps are then repositioned over the haptics and fibrin glue is applied to secure the flaps. So let's look at the video. The video is uh, courtesy of Dr. Amar Agarwal. It's his technique. He marks the cornea so that uh, you can get exactly diametrically opposite uh, scleral flaps. The scleral flaps are performed with a present knife. He's using a trocar cannula there. And then he uses a 23 gauge needle to make him make uh, sclerotomies. And that's a clear corneal incision, 3 millimeter clear corneal incision. He, uses the vitrectomy through the sclerotomy uh, to perform a vitrectomy and clear all the vitreous. Then this is a forceps. You can use a 23 or 25 gauge forceps and uh, injects the lens, holds the haptic and brings it out through the sclerotomy. The same thing is done on the other side. And this is the handshake technique where you have to hand over the haptic from one hand to the other. Then a 26 gauge needle is used to make a tunnel at the edge of the scleral flap. And then the haptic is stuck into the tunnel needle track. The same thing is uh, performed on the opposite side. And after that, the area is dried and glue is applied and the flap is closed. You can put in air or saline. You can do a peripheral iridectomy also and close the conventor. The advantages of the glued IOL is uh, no suture related issues like loosening, slippage, late erosion, or degradation. Allows the use of foldable IOLs and through a very small corneal incision, a sub three millimeter incision. All maneuvers are performed under direct visualization. The desired length of the haptic that is embedded in the scleral tunnel can be adjusted so that you can get an optimal IOL centration and minimal rotation. 
there's no pseudo donosis because the lens is fairly uh, rigid when it's fixed and uh, now there's almost 10 years of experience with the glued eye wells uh, so he also published uh, his results in the jcrs uh, complications and visual outcomes um, where the study comprised uh, 208 eyes of 185 uh, patients Interop complications were high femur in 0.4%, haptic breakage for 0.4%, and deformed haptics 0.9%. Late complications occurred in 39 eyes, which is like 18.7%, and uh, included uh, optic capture in 4.3%, IOL decentration 3.3%, haptic extrusion in 1.9%, subconjunctival haptic in 1.4%, macular edema in 1.9% and pigment dispersion in 1.9%. However, these complication, complications are much lower than the uh, suture fixated uh, scleral eye wells. So the long-term results were fairly satisfactory without serious complications. The limitations of this technique is uh, requires familiarity with transcleral work and transferring the haptic from one forceps to the other, what is called handshake technique, as well as uh, sometimes you may need help from an assistant also at some points uh, in the surgery, requires dissection of the conjunctiva and creation of scleral flaps. Uh, so it takes a little longer time. And uh, you require familiarity with the anterior techniques, ideally through the past plan after making the sclerotomy. So I think we'll stop here and uh, take some questions before we go on to the latest techniques, which are just which I've evolved in the past couple of uh, years. Yes. So that was uh, really nice, uh, Dr. Shriganesh. Uh, you showed uh, very beautiful uh, surgical videos, and of course, the glued eye technique, which has evolved uh, over the years. So there was uh, uh, one question about uh, you know whether the proline suture. So this was about the scleral fixation sutured technique whether the proline suture will uh, erode uh, through the conjunctiva or, you know, if it's not. So I think they mean that if it is exposed because once you've buried it under the scleral flap. So I was wondering, uh, you know, this uh, from that a question came up. Today, if you had to do, for example, that uh, bag fixation, would you choose to do, uh, you know, the suture through, maybe through a Hoffman's pocket because the risk of erosion might be less. And I'm sure you'll show about that. Also, uh, would you prefer today to use, uh, I think, again, that is probably going to come up. You're going to show your, uh, dumbbell technique, but yeah. these are all questions which are leading on to the newer techniques and which will show us why the newer techniques are better. And uh, there was another question that is iridectomy always necessary in SFIOL? So would you like to speak on that? Yeah, iridectomy, it is safer to do an iridectomy because sometimes uh, if you are not, if, uh, if the lens is a little more anterior, you can get a pupillary block. And when you get a pupillary block, you can get secondary glaucoma. So if you have done an iridectomy, then this reduces the risk of pupillary block and secondary glaucoma. So it is better to do an iridectomy. You can just do it with a vitrector. That's what I do. You can set the cut rate very low at 50 cuts, and then um, you change it to aspiration first and cutting uh, second, which is different from what you use for your vitrector, which is cutting first and aspiration next. And you just go in gently aspirate and then because the cut rate is very low, one or two cuts is enough and you'll get a nice small uh, vitrectomy. I show, uh, showed that iridectomy and that is adequate. It is very fast to do and you already have your vitrector there. So you can do it through the side port also. And, do you like uh, to do it under viscoelastic or uh, under like infusion? What is better? Either. I mean, if, if, it's, uh, if you are using viscoelastic, you can do it with viscoelastic. If you have an infusion, then it's fine. For all uh, scleral uh, fixated uh, eye wells, either sutured or sutureless, I prefer to put in a trocar cannula. For iris retrofixation, you don't need a trocar uh, cannula, but for all the scleral fixations, it is better. It maintains the chamber uh, better and uh, prevents collapse, and your visualization is better. Mm -hmm. Also, one uh, question before I pass it on to Dr. Sheetal. There is a question that... Uh, you know, I think somebody wants to know that when you pass the suture through that uh, haptic, uh, the IL bag complex, did you pass it, you know, around the haptic or through the edge of the optic or, you know, like through the bag? So can you elaborate a little bit that where exactly the suture is to pass? Yeah, the suture basically goes from underneath 
it pierces the bag around the uh, CTR and the haptic. Mm -hmm. And at the edge of the haptic where there is a small bulb, the Alcon lens, and then I bring it anteriorly. So it is just looped around. And uh, because the CTR is there and also there is capsular fibrosis, plus this small knob of the haptic, the, basically the suture cannot slip or move. Yes. So it does not tear the bag. So that is in fact uh, uh, that's absolutely right. You know, I recently in I think the AIS Film Festival we saw somebody you know pass the suture through the edge of the optic. Have you ever tried that? I mean, this is just for sake of discussion that you know somebody showed a technique where you can hold the lens and pass a 10-0 proline or a 9-0 proline straight needle through the edge of the haptic and fix it. You know, if the haptics are broken or something, they pass. Have you ever tried that? And is it safe to do? No, I haven't tried it. And then what happens is you have too long a suture. The longer the suture is, the higher the risk of movement of the lens, tilting of the lens. Mm. If you have a very short suture, then the risk of, you know, tilting or movement of the lens is less. The longer the suture. So mm. if you have to pass it through the haptic, one is uh, through the optic. The optic is quite firm. Mm. So you need counter pressure. You'll have to hold the lens with the forceps. And then you need a lot of force to pass this needle through the IUL, you'll have to tilt the IUL, you'll have, and again, you have to be at the edge, and this can again cause some amount of dysphotopsia, mm. and um, you're basically damaging the optic, plus you have a very long suture, and this can cause yo-yoing, tilt of the lens, so it's not an ideal situation, I would not do it. I agree. I agree. Dr. Sheetal, would you like to ask any questions? Yeah, uh, sir mentioned about the trocar cannula. So this is a question related to that from Dr. Leroy. He wants to know uh, what is the pressure or bottle height set at when you are using a trocar cannula? So you, you just need to have adequate infusion to maintain the, uh, the globe. So even if it's at 30 to 35 uh, centimeters, it is adequate, the bottle height. You don't have to have a very high IOP. It is just to maintain the chamber. All right. So there's another question from Dr. Jayant. He wants to know, can we use AC maintainer instead of trocar when we are using doing the serial fixation? Yeah, you can use an AC maintainer, but the AC maintainer, again, is an irritant because it comes in your field and sometimes it can slip out. So you have to have a self-retaining uh, AC maintainer uh, the screw type sense uh, self retaining uh, AC maintainer, and you will have to uh, make another uh, corneal incision and then uh, put it in. You also have uh, AC uh, maintainer trocar cannula by Amar Agarwal. It's I think it is uh, available from uh, um, this one of these uh, US companies, Masket, I think. And uh, you can use that also if you, if you are not very comfortable passing a trocar cannula through the pass planner, but uh, actually the pass planner is better. It's uh, self-sealing most of the times, and once you get the hang of it, it is quite easy to do. So you can use a trocar cannula through the pass planner, and you can practice in the wet lab and uh, learn how to do it. Uh, but you you can use uh, self-retaining uh, cannula also, AC, AC maintainer. Okay, uh, Dr. Kali Shankar again wants to know what is the distance of sclerotomy site from limbus in glued IOLs? It's about uh, two millimeters uh, for the glued IOL. Basically, you have to be in the pass planner. Ganesh, there are some people who don't use glue at all. They're doing the same technique and, you know, using uh, the gamma yeah. tunnel. You know, so but no glue. So, do you think that's safe enough, or is there a risk that uh, thing will come up? Because glue actually is gone in some time. But uh, you know, I thought that glue was basically to have the flap stick back more than the retaining the haptic. But what's your thought? The glue, I think, is basically for uh, sticking the uh, scleral flap and also uh, the conjunctiva. I think it's more useful for that. It may not really hold the. Uh, haptic in place. So it's very important to make a proper carrier tunnel so that your haptic is fixed firmly there. And if you make a proper uh, carrier tunnel, then basically the risk of the haptic coming out is not there. But the glue probably would give some additional reinforcement and it uh, helps to close the 
plant well and the content timeline is much faster to do than use sutures and cosmetically it's better dr sital any other question one more question we can take uh, dr malikarjun wants to know whether the normal pc foldable iol can be used for sf iol patients the foldable single piece i think you mean single piece iol cannot be used for glued iol um so you have to use a three piece lens so you can use uh, either the bosch norm lens which is basically silicon with uh, a three piece uh, pmma haptics or you can use the sensor iol or uh, the alcon uh, three piece lens so these are the lenses uh, which can be used uh, for uh, glued iol but it has to be a three piece lens you can't pass the haptic you can't make a, a tunnel which is large enough to take the haptic even a pmma haptic also is not ideal hmm. The, did you single piece pmma lens shri did you have any complications yourself in your practice with glued iols that prompted you to move on to the newer techniques that you are going to talk about uh, like what difficulties did you face or any complications that you faced i haven't done a lot of glued iols so that's why that video is from uh, dr amar amar uh, um i was doing iris retrofixation then i moved on to yamane and now uh, the uh, modified the canabrava dumbbell technique which i've been doing for uh, past couple of years uh, because yamane also i had some issues and i'll talk about it uh, but uh, basically glued iol takes a little longer time because you have to reflect the conjunctiva make the flat um, so that is the reason why i really didn't get into it um, the fast the yamane is a little is faster to do and then uh, you don't have to reflect the content so i'll be talking about that next so i think we are all set uh, to see what okay. you're going to show us uh, the new techniques and uh, you know they are really interesting so i must tell all the viewers to watch out keenly and you know come back to us with questions so that you know we have more question these are the techniques you are probably going to start using if you are not using them already so please watch out so these are the newer techniques which have just come out in the past uh, couple of years Uh, and they are relatively new, and people are are just adopting them. Um, so the first uh, technique uh, which I would be speaking about is the Yamane technique. This is the new intraspinal fixation method, which was described by Shin Yamane and colleagues. It's also known as the double needle flanged haptic technique because you flange the haptics uh, using a pair of bent thin walled wide bore 30 gauge needles of course that is these thin walled uh, needles are not freely available in india so i use a 27 uh, gauge needle from bd uh, so you uh, you can use that also and with the iwell uh in situ the surgeon inserts the needle through the sclera 2 mm posterior to the limbus and feeds the haptics into the lumen of the needle the needle and sheath haptics are then withdrawn out of the scleral tunnel and simultaneously fixates the two haptics in those tunnels and then the surgeon cauterizes the protruding end of each haptic to fashion flanges that prevent the haptic from slipping back into the uh, eye through the tunnels and so it prevents uh, dislocation so let's look at the original yamane technique by yamane this is a uh, He has done a pars plana vitrectomy, three port pars plana vitrectomy, and that's the clear corneal incision, and then two side ports. And uh, after vitrectomy, this is uh, the SI thirty lens with the bag which has dislocated. He cuts the lens into two pieces and then removes the lens. And this is the. Three-piece IOL being inserted in front of the iris. So he places the lens in front of the iris. The trailing haptic is still there through the. Then he passes this 30 gauge needle diagonally. It's a bent 30 gauge needle, and then holds the haptic and feeds it with a cannulated forceps into the lumen of this needle. once you have placed about 1 1.5 mm into the lumen 
then you just pull out the needle gently here he does not pull out the needle he places the needle then he goes to the opposite side and then again passes this needle it's about 1.72 mm from the limbus he passes it about 1.5 to 1.7 mm you can see that it is bent then brings it then through the side port with the cannulated forceps he passes the haptic into the lumen and again you know he has now he has fixed both the haptics into the needles he simultaneously pulls out both the haptics okay then holds the forceps and then releases the needle then he uses a low temperature cautery this is you cannot use bipolar you have to use a thermal cautery to create the flange so the flange prevents it from slipping back through the tunnel then he just pushes the haptic back so that the flange is goes subconjunctively you can see the haptic is being pushed and this is the original uh, yamane technique and the lens is centered and the pars plana cannula trocar cannula is removed infusion is removed and that's the end of the procedure that's the original yamane technique um i started with the yamane technique is more than a couple of years and then uh, actually when i saw him uh, do it uh, at the acrs he got the i think the grand prize at the acrs i think it was in new orleans in, uh, about two three years ago and uh, i came back and started trying it but then you know the needle has to be held by the assistant so if you are using both the needles passing it sometimes if the needle if the assistant pulls the needle then uh, the haptic can slip out so then i kind of uh, modified the technique and i think uh, a few others also have been doing this this is a modified yamane technique which uh, i first put in the uh, trocar cannula infusion so that's the infusion then this is the tunnel so this was again a dislocated uh, iul with the capsular bag i've done a vitrectomy i'm holding it with the forceps through the side port so that it does not slip back i'm using the mst uh, scissors to cut the lens this is a hydrophilic lens you don't have to cut it completely i cut it 3 fourths and then rotate it out through the 2.8 mm incision that's so that's how i have explanted this lens so the first thing you should do before opening the eye is put in the infusion and the eye is formed this is a vitrectomy being performed i just sweep the iris for any vitreous strands you can see the vitreous strands there performed the iridectomy you can also use tramsinolone i make a side port to the right and use an iris hook this is very important for step for visualization this is a sensor three piece iul which i am loading it into a shooter kind of a injector i just mark diametrically opposite and uh, this is 1.7 mm away this is the needle this is a 27 gauge bd needle which i bend i pass it diagonally and then enter so it is 1.7 mm away and 1.7 mm long then i just shoot the haptic into the lumen of the needle so that is with the injector i am just shooting the haptic once i do that once it is firm then i completely release the optic and withdraw the injector i pull out the needle here hold it with the forceps and then cauterize here i'm using a squint hook this is one of my older videos now if you don't have a thermal cautery you can just heat a squint hook as a look and then do that 
then i hold the other trailing haptic the needle is passed there pass it through the lumen pass it about 1.5 mm so it's firm enough see because i have good visualization i need not push it too much if i don't have good visualization and if i have to push the haptic to the center that can distort or release the other haptic then i flange the haptic after pulling it out and that's the so it's a fairly simple procedure and you can see that the iul is very well centered and you don't have to reflect the conjunctiva you don't have to make scleral flaps i'm just checking with any vitreous strands there i remove the infusion cannula and you can see that the lens is well centered i just hydrate the clear corneal incision it holds well and uh, that's the end of the procedure sometimes with yemeni you can have uh, issues also this is uh, a patient who had a recurrent pupillary capture and you can see the pigments on the lens and the pupil is distorted because of uh, recurrent uh, pupillary capture so the disadvantage of the yemeni is that uh, you are not sure of the effective lens position you can have refractive surprises you can have decentration you can have tilt if you do not make the incisions diametrically opposite you can have decentration if you do not have symmetrical tunnels you can have tilt and if you are too anterior then you can have pupillary capture of the iul so the advantages of 3 mna technique it's conceptually a simple technique and easy to perform no need for conjunctival dissection and scleral flaps you can uh, use a foldable iul three piece foldable iul through a small incision there's less hypotony compared to scleral suture fixation or glued iul and currently yes it's one of the fastest methods of uh, sutureless foldable pc iul uh, fixation and i tends to be quite post op cosmetically it looks very good rapid visual recovery limitations are surgically yes you need some amount of expertise uh, requires familiarity with anterior vitreotomy techniques and uh, ideally as yes, past plan also you should be able to put in an uh, infusion uh, haptic placement is extremely critical like i said uh, 1.7 to 2 mm away from the nimbus and it has to be diametrically opposite surgeon's view is uh, obstructed during the intrascleral passes and to decrease the chance of uh, optic rotation it is important to achieve at least 1.7 to 2 mm uh, scleral tunnel with the needle during the intrascleral pass and it should be circumlinear with the limbus so these are some of the points that you have to keep in mind it is better to mark of course yemeni now has a device uh, for placing the needles and uh, i have got that also i tried using it but it is for the classic yemeni technique uh, and it needs 30 gauge they uh, it was not available in 27 but they said they want to have it in the 27 gauge cannula uh, needle because in india getting the 30 gauge needle is uh, difficult the thin bore ones and most of the haptics don't go in through a regular 30 gauge needle limitations of yemeni uh, prospective study found that iul fixation um iul fixation uh, with the mna technique uh, were tilted most of the lenses uh, by 13.2 degrees compared to 4.8 degrees with the glued iul so the glued iul tilt is uh, less than uh, with the mna so with the mna you can have more of a tilt and the induced coma and uh, induced astigmatism imperative to do follow up every 6 months for potential extrusion of the haptic subconjunctivally through the thin walled uh, scleral tunnel so this is something you have to be careful about also ganesh i think uh, you know we've got lots of questions would you like to stop here for 2 minutes before you go on to your last uh, your your uh, for haptic plant or huh? or do you want to finish that and then we come back for the questions because people are really uh, couple questions of about questions. the mna for uh, Three four minutes. Yeah, because people years. are really interested, and uh, you know, yeah. so one uh, question is that how difficult or easy it is to shoot the haptic into the lumen of the needle. 
actually it is not very difficult uh, it is easier than using your forceps because when you use your forceps um, if there is shallowing of the chamber then there is a higher risk of endothelial damage endothelial touch uh, when you are doing this i find uh, uh, with the shooter of course the important thing is you can't use the screw type of uh, injector you have to use the shooter so with the shooter with a very controlled injection it is possible to thread it in uh, what is very important is you should not move the needle if you move the needle you will tear the intrascleral tunnel if you tear the intrascleral tunnel then the flange can go in through so that is something which is very important that you do not actually move the needle once you pass it you just have to move your injector and see that the uh, haptic is exactly uh perpendicular to the uh, lumen of the needle and then slowly inject it so and then it's able to uh, you're able to actually put the haptic through the lumen so it's it's not very difficult and i i find that it is safer and what's your shooter like you know typically what uh, you know with the sensor three piece they provide is a unfolder kind of a thing so uh, yeah, what kind of a shooter a, you you will have to ask jnj uh, to give you a shooter they have shooters also for the three piece so you have to use a shooter for the three piece with the sensor you cannot use the unfolder with the unfolder it's very uncomfortable because the assistant has to screw in and you don't yeah. have the control of that shooting it into the lumen so you will have to use a shooter right and uh, third question another question is that what is the name of the instrument used to mark the opposite uh, scleral incision basically the 180 so you can use any instrument uh, you can use uh, the uh, markers for rk if you have a old rk marker you can use it you can also use uh, your markerless system you can use a callisto um, or the other one from uh, alcon uh, mm, virion so you get uh, mm. the virion system so you get the 0180 line there so uh, that line itself uh, can be used and you can just put the ink marks there across the line um or you can even use a mendes gauge so anything works okay so another question that have you ever seen any case of slipped uh, stump into the vitreous especially in high myopic patient as they might have thin sclerosis and in fact uh, shri you know i was on keranet recently and there was a lot of discussion about one case where somebody had done a yamani and uh, you know the bulbous end uh, after 2 3 months had started you know kind of extruding he was taken up for surgery again and it was pushed back but then you know a week later it again kind of uh, protruded so are there any tips for ensuring that you know that thing which is embedded like the bulbous end which you have pushed into the yeah. you know small scleral pocket under the conjunctiva but doesn't really uh, protrude out again yeah. or erode so again so basically see basically while creating the flange you should not touch the the cautery to the hap if you touch the uh, cautery to the haptic it gets distorted and when it gets distorted then it does not sit snugly uh, at the sclera mm. and the chances of extrusion are more and the surface is rough when you touch it with the cautery so when the surface is rough and the conjunctiva moves over it there will be um, uh, an extrusion the conjunctiva erodes over this bulbous area and then there can be extrusion so you have to just bring it very close to the uh, haptic and when you bring it very close you will see that uh, it is almost conical the flange is conical it's not like a rivet it becomes conical so part of it actually uh, snugly sits into the scleral uh, tunnel the entrance of the uh, intrascleral tunnel the other point is that like i told before that you should not move the needle when you pass the needle intrascleralily and suppose you move the needle it tears the intrascleral tunnel when it tears the intrascleral tunnel then the tunnel is enlarged and so then uh, the flange is not limited it goes through the tunnel because the tunnel is widened so it's very important not to move the needle if you move the needle it tears the tunnel so that's a very important point if you don't do that because i have not had any dislocations inside i have had one case um which was referred because there was a severe tilt um and uh, poor visual acuity i think i'll show that video also uh yeah 
in fact there is another question from dr sachin that so these are some of the uh, points sir uh, celery sulcus is 1 mm you are basically not uh, placing it in the ciliary sulcus should i should i read that yeah okay. yeah so th that was the question in fact that uh, you know the ciliary sulcus is maximum 1 to 1.5 so why are you trying to go from 2 mm that's what uh, i think yeah, why take 2 mm distance from limbus yeah because you need the intrascleral tunnel mm -hmm. you need the intrascleral tunnel if you are going very close then what happens is that your tunnel will be short or you have to go um uh parallel to the limbus for quite uh, some and then what happens is your the haptics are too long so the lens sits more posteriorly mm -hmm. so i think uh, so there's some other question but i think uh, yeah but Both you can the glue dye wells yeah. and the mna technique uh, critical steps of tunneling in the sclera and sclerotomy entry is challenging in terms of reproducibility and standardization but uh, since it's a two point fixation both these techniques i will tilt is an issue and potential extrusion of the haptic subconjunctival through a thin wall sclerotomy tunnel this is something that we discussed and let me just uh, this is the okay now let's there was one more sorry no this okay this is um, the case which i wanted to show of mna you can see after trauma this is how to explant a lens after mna so there was severe decentration and tilt so i reflected the conjunctiva i am able to find the flange i pulled on the flange and then i cut the flange so this side the flange has gone through so one side i was able to find the flange and i cut it then i hold the haptic and then i am cutting the haptic at the haptic optic junction and i remove this haptic so this is a flange which i cut here i was not able to find the flange because it so what i did was i cut the up uh, haptic at the optic haptic junction held the haptic and then pulled it out so this is uh, where i uh, the explantation for the dumbbell but before this i will go on to the other dumbbell technique and then i will show you this video so this just to show how sure. you can expand uh, the lens you will have to kind of reflect the conjunctiva find the flange lift it up cut the flange and then on either side and then you can expand it so are there any other questions or we can go into the go in for the last uh, I think you can. There is one quick question which I had actually, Shri, that uh, you know, uh, when you, how much of the haptic can you shorten by doing the cautery? Like, what is the ideal recommended amount? Where should you hold it when applying the cautery, and how much? And there was somebody who had asked that, how do you sterilize the cautery? That was another question I saw as they were coming up. Lots of questions. This, so these two uh, things. This cautery. See, if it is a, if it's a muzzle hook, then you can kind of uh, autoclave it. But for the uh, cautery, the heat cautery. electric uh, cautery which is the pen type which you get uh, the bovi cautery basically we clean it with uh, isopropyl alcohol and then wrap it in uh, sterile uh, cover cloth and then use it because the heat itself at the tip is sterile once it gets heated to that temperature it is uh, sterile so what we do is we just clean it with isopropyl alcohol and then it is covered with uh, with a cloth sleeve and then we use it perfect so we'll go on to the last uh, topic uh, the four flange yes okay. so this is the what is known as a double flanged haptic um, technique can be used for capsular tension ring or for uh, um, fixating uh, pmma lenses this was described by uh, sajio kanabrava and uh, colleagues and uh, this four flange intrascleral iol fixation uh, technique is basically for non foldable iols 
for PMMA IELTS, which he has uh, described. And I think he has also described uh, how it can be used for the aqueous lens. Um, I have been uh, doing a different, slightly modified technique from two years. I have not known about it, um, but it's a modified uh, Canabrava technique. Uh, I call it the dumbbell technique, and I've been doing it. So I'll show you how I do uh, the technique because Canabrava basically railroads the uh, proline suture, but um, I uh, thread it into a pre thread it into a 27 or 30 gauge needle and then uh, do it. So let me just show you. Uh, so what you need materials needed is uh, two 30 gauge needle or 27 gauge needles. So you don't have to bend these needles. Uh, 60 proline sutures. Again, uh, see with 90 proline, it degrades over eight, 10 years. But if you're using 60 proline, it's so much thicker and it should last for 25, 30 years or even more. So that's the whole idea of using uh, proline sutures, uh, 60 proline. And you need a PMMA IOL, IOL with uh, eyelets, the same IOL which you use for spleral fixation. And you use a Bowie thermal slow cautery. So this is a technique uh, where uh, I reflect the conjunctiva and make a scleral tunnel. This is a 6.5 mm tunnel. And then uh, I put in viscoelastic. I pre thread uh, four to five centimeters of 60 proline into this is a 30 gauge needle. You can use a 27 gauge needle also. It is threaded in up to the tip. And here I am doing an anterior vitrectomy. You can do an anterior vitrectomy. You can use a trocar cannula. So I normally like to use a trocar cannula. In this case, uh, I haven't used a trocar cannula. This is one of the earlier cases. I've just used viscoelastic. You can also do this technique with viscoelastic. I've extended the tunnel to 6.5 millimeters for the PMMA lens. Now 1.7 millimeters away, diametrically opposite. You can mark it. Here I haven't marked it, but I know visually that it is 0, 0,180. Then I push the suture from behind and pull it through the main incision and then pull out the needle. So I have the 6-oproline needle going transconjunctival, transcleral through the pars plana. Again, on the other side, I repeat it, push the suture through and pull it. So I have uh, two sutures coming out through the main incision. Then you take the uh, PMMA lens. This is a very fast technique and easy to perform. Then very important is that you have to lift the suture and pass it from above below. So I'm passing it above below. This direction is very important. And then you can pull it, say about three millimeters. And then you, this is the Bowie pottery. You can use that to create the flange. You can see that there's a nice flange created. You'll have to see that the flange is adequate and does not come out through the eyelet. So I'm pulling it and seeing that it is stable and does not come out through the eyelet. After that, I pick up the other suture, you will have to see that the sutures don't cross or get intertwined. Okay, pass it from above below. You can even gently place the lens in the tunnel so that it is supported there. Above below, pull it for about three millimeters, then create the flange, check that the flange is stable and it does not come out through the eyelet. And then you just push in the, insert the lens and put it behind the iris there. So I'm pushing it behind the iris. And then I like to dial the trialing haptic because if you try to push it with the forceps, sometimes it breaks. So you have to be careful. I prefer to kind of gently dial it under the iris. Okay. 
and then you you pull on both the sutures once you pull on both the sutures the lens basically centers beautifully here there is no diagonal tunnel the tunnels are going perpendicularly so there is no chance of tilt or decentration so once you pull it taut with the forceps hold it close to the conjunctiva then cut it about 2 mm away with a scissor and then apply the heat cautery to get a nice flange tight flange the suture should not be loose again the same thing is performed on the other side create a flange and then it's like a rivet so you have it's like a dumbbell on ubm you can see that two ends which are bulbous so you just place it subconjunctively like i said you should not touch the proline so that it's not rough it is smooth like a rivet so the conjunctiva slips over it so i just wash out the little viscoelastic you can see that there's a small strand of vitreous residue over the tummy there and then that's the end of the procedure um, tunnel is holding well i don't have to suture it so you get very nice uh, very well centered lens and there's no risk of tilt there's no yo-yoing it's very simple it's fast easy to do so this is the two weeks post op photograph you can see the lens is very well centered and you can see the flanges subconjunctively so this is uh, that case which i showed where yamane was done and uh, i had to kind of remove it so here i was not able to find the flange part of it probably had gone into the sclera so then i just cut the haptic remove the haptic on the left side and then held the lens and then haptic remove the optic i was supporting it with the needle and then move the optic you can also use a retractor see here i am able to do a dumbbell the same technique you can see that i have done the dumbbell technique and put the pmma lens and it is centered well there is some amount of traumatic mediasis because of uh, the patient had a trauma and you can see that the pupil is irregular but the lens is very well centered that's just the area where it reflected the conjunctiva which is a little away here i'm doing a pupilloplasty also because the pupil is irregular and it was distorted so this is the sft technique single throw pupilloplasty what so with the sft technique you are able to get a fairly decent pupil that's the end of the procedure so i have put in three um sutures with sft and you get a nice uh, so that was the repair and this patient did uh, quite well explantation of the mna and uh, the dumbbell technique so some of the advantages and limitations technically it's a very simple procedure it's fast uh, flapless glueless no conjunctival dissection required no scleral flaps or intrascleral tunnels and you get a very well centered eye well current limitation is that you have to perform a scleral tunnel uh, at least 5.5 but usually the scleral lenses are uh, 6.5 mm pmma lenses so we have designed a foldable uh, eye well we are just doing some trials with uh, this this is uh, 
the design of the foldable lens. It is inserted through a 2.8 mm incision. It has got a optic of six millimeters and 13 millimeters overall. It's got winged haptics with holes in the periphery, and it's also got landmark holes to see the orientation. And it's got a angulation of 15 degrees. It's a hydrophilic lens with rounded optic edges. Let us uh, look at the video of the insertion. So this is the technique. I have passed the needle and pulled out the citroproline suture. Again, from the other side. So I have two sutures. I go in with a pull through forceps and pull these sutures through a cartridge. So that's a cartridge. And this is the lens which I've designed. And then I pass the suture from above, below, and then flange it. Check that the flange uh, is stable. And the same thing is repeated for the trialing haptic, the hole in the trialing haptic. And then I flange it. So once it is flanged, then you can place the lens in the cartridge, fold the cartridge, and you put it in a front loading injector. This is a front loading injector. Okay. And then you can inject it through a 2.8 mm incision. Okay. And once it is inserted below the iris, then you can pull the suture and then flange it. Pull the suture tight, flange it on either side. And uh, so this technique you are able to do through a 2.8 mm clear corneal incision. And uh, it's well centered. So this is uh, the new technique, the new lens. And we have applied for a patent. And uh, we want to do a few more implants, refine the design. And hopefully, it should be available for uh, commercial use in a couple of years. So to conclude, uh, all techniques are here to stay from iris retrofixation to MNA the dumbbell technique, each offering its own advantages in certain settings and in the hands of particular surgeons. Modified four flange technique is effective and may be easy to perform for surgeons who don't do intrascleral fixation techniques routinely. Of course, we have to look at the long-term experience and the foldable IOL will address issues of post-op astigmatism due to the scleral tunnel creation. So thank you very much. If there are any questions, uh, we can take them. Let Sheetal ask first. There's lots of questions. Dr. Sheetal, you would like to ask or should uh, I fire up a few? Actually, um, okay, so I think uh, Dr. P.S. Brar wants to know, uh, uh, this is about the Yamane technique. So while making scleral tunnel in Yamane, when you turn from tangential to straight towards the pupil, can the tunnel be torn and how to prevent this? Yeah. So basically, I mark um, 1.7 to 1 to 2 millimeters away from the limbus, and then also above or on the left hand side and below on the right hand side. So when you pass it, you will have to pass it from the mark from above towards uh, the the limbus, and once you have uh reach the limbus then you kind of turn the needle inside you should not press against the tunnel if you press against the tunnel or move the needle then you can tear the tunnel if you tear the tunnel then you can have problems so you have to go diagonally all right so uh, i think dr gobinder wants to know uh, how have you done Yamane technique for children? If so, then after what age? I have no experience of uh, Yamane in children. I have done iris retrofixation in children. Um, they are doing quite well. Uh, we had one case of dislocation. But the Yamane in uh, pediatric cases so far, 
I have not uh, done it, but uh, yes, you can do it in children. Um, I think the so is a little softer. It's difficult to do the uh, iris atrophication in children because uh, Yamani, if, if the children have uh, allergic conjunctivitis or something, they keep rubbing the eyes. There may be a chance of. Uh, if if there is allergic conjunctivitis, then uh, any form of scleral fixation is not ideal because the uh, conjunctiva is inflamed and they are chronically rubbing their eyes. There can be extrusion, so that is not uh, ideal. But you can do it in children, not very young children, because the eye again is growing, so the limbus can expand. Uh, there can be. Uh, problems. I don't think uh, anything is published on uh, pediatric uh, Yemeni. I haven't had any experience with uh, doing Yemeni in children, but iris retrofixation, yes, it works. So, does the dumbbell erode when you use the conjunctiva? Is one question. The dumbbell does not erode the conjunctiva because it's very smooth. What is important is you do not touch the cautery to the Suture. If you touch the cautery to the suture and it becomes irregular and rough, there can be erosion. Otherwise, it is very smooth, like a, like the top of a rivet. So the conjunctiva slides over it. So there is no erosion. So far, in two years, we have not had any cases of erosion. So Ganesh, is there a difference between the direction of the you know entry into the for your uh, dumbbell technique versus the Yamane? I mean, in the Yamane, you're obviously having a longer intrascleral. Yes. Uh, you know, tunnel, but in the suture, do you still make the same or is there a difference? No, no, no. Yeah, see, in the Yamane, you need to have a tunnel which is about 1.8 to 2 millimeters. So two it is an intrascleral right. tunnel. Here, there is no intrascleral tunnel. Right. You are just going perpendicularly it's directly. Going straight, right? It's right. going straight, so it's so much easier. You just have to so pass it's just like a rivet. So it's, there's no kind of, uh, you know, intrascleral pass no, there passage. Is no intrascleral, yeah. So it becomes. Just the other thing is that. Uh, do you use the 5.0 or the 6.0? I didn't listen to that part. Uh, 6 which proline? I use 6.0. 6.0 proline. Mm -hmm. I think Kana Brava initially described it with uh, 5.0, but 5.0 is more difficult to handle. Mm -hmm. um, it's stiffer. The 6.0 is easier to handle and then you can uh, thread it uh, even through a 30 gauge needle. But 27 is much more easier. And you're so using the BD? I'm using BD. the BD 27 gauge needle. All right. Somebody asked that why don't you, for the flange to be buried, why don't you make scleral flaps? So I know the answer, but I'll want you to answer that. Yeah. I mean, uh, basically, you don't want to reflect the conjunctiva. You right. don't want to make scleral flaps. So that's the whole point in doing these uh, techniques. So again, reflecting the conjunctiva, making it doesn't make sense. Right. Not and you know, it's, it's really interesting. Your uh, new lens looks so beautiful. I mean, you know, it kind of answers all the questions you might have about this technique because, you know, otherwise you have to use a bigger incision, a conjunctival flap, a scleral uh, tunnel. So, you know, I think the foldable lens looks really exciting. When do you think? Uh, so, one question was, what's the material? So, I think it's a hydrophilic uh, lens. Hydrophilic because hydrophilic and basically uh, is more, yeah, is more friendly to uveal tissue. Yes. Because here it's going to sit against the uveal tissue and it is rounded. It's not square edge. It's rounded 360 degrees. So again, it's more uh, UVA friendly and uh, it's soft material and the hydrophilic lenses can go in very easily through the uh, even a 2.8 mm or 2.2 also for that matter. So when does it, when is it likely to become commercially available, Dr. Ganesh? Uh, we just got the prototypes. We have done probably three, four cases uh, so far. Uh, we still have to, there are a few issues which we are sorting out. One of the issues is that uh, if the flange is not adequate, because the soft material expands like PM, unlike PMMA, mm -hmm. so the hole can expand, the hole in the haptic. So if, if you pu pull a lot and if there's a lot of pressure, then the flange can come through the hole because it's a soft material and it can expand. So we are looking at how to get around that and I have given some uh, designs for that. So there is a, this is a prototype which I just wanted to show the work which we are doing, but we will refine it and uh, we should get our patents uh, approved and then go and, so it will take at least two years or more. Um, working on a couple of other designs also. So I think then uh, we In fact, I also good. like the design of your other lens, which, you know, kind of anchors onto the capsular rim and that yeah. stabilizes the lens and, you know, kind of positions it perfectly. 
that's a brilliant design as well the now i had a quick question it. yes absolutely i also wanted to know that uh, which of these techniques like today for two questions one is that today if you had to choose one of these techniques like between the yamane and the double planche and the glued and the other techniques what would come to you instinctively as your first choice that's one question now, and then i'll come to the I'm second later on i'm doing the double planche double planche now yeah because how many would you have done it? like how many cases and how long is your experience now uh, i think we must have done about uh, 30 35 uh, we have yeah. the data we have the data yes so and I what how long is the thing kind of uh, you know possible how complications it is, uh, the uh, the uh, longest follow up is about 2 years yeah great Sort of that's a pretty long follow up that's yeah. a very long follow up but that's not all the 35 uh, some of them of course stuff, yes yeah. some mm-hmm. of them the early ones that right. we started but most of them are doing very well mm-hmm. uh, so we have not had to kind of explant or uh, and we have not had any decentration on uh, significant and now i have a question for dr sheetal uh, oh, what okay well, i have a question about yeah okay i have a question for you like uh, ganesh being a very gifted surgeon and you yourself being a gifted surgeon as well the learning curve for somebody who is wanting to learn one of these techniques which of these techniques has the most uh, the simplest or the shortest learning curve and you know for an average surgeon which technique would be easy to perform i think retrofixation is is quite easy even our uh, fellows are doing their managing their complications uh, i was also doing retrofixation for uh, most of my cases until i uh, started doing the um, the dumbbell technique the double planche technique and once i started doing i never uh, did uh, a single retrofixated i o l but so did you find it very easy to transition like easy. did you first start doing glued i o l s and then went on to yamani no, no, and the no, double no, planche or no, you no. went straight to mm-hmm. it was my first serial fixation uh, technique which and, i did ever and in your first two three cases did you have any problems or complications or things that you know which are learning messages for people who might want to start with it yes i want to make a very important comment about this technique uh you have to ensure that there are no capsular remnants or mm-hmm. bag remnants because i had uh, a problem in i think it was my ninth or 10th case uh with this technique uh, i was already familiar with the with the method and the technique and everything was fine the orientation the uh, the flanges but the lens did not center at all and i was trying to figure out what's what's wrong uh, in the case why it is not centering finally i could make out that there were some remnants and because the thing is that it's a big optic and then the haptics are long they are pmma uh, haptics and they are staying inside so you are not like taking them out uh, through sclerotomy so uh, uh, so so if there's anything which is obstructing these haptics that can lead to tilt so the lens was continuously like few times i tried uh, i was checked everything but it was just tilting and uh, that was one case where i had to actually explant the lens i had to cut all the uh, sutures and take it out and also is it important to do a for that case is it also important to do a good vitrectomy for uh, like have a have a clear area there was in fact another question which i now remember somebody had asked that for retrofixated iris claw is it important to do a good uh, you know anterior vitrectomy and have it clear i guess for almost all these techniques you know it's good to have the vitreous out of the way and i think transplant assisted the vitrectomy as you showed in one of the cases is uh, brilliant there was another question i think uh, was about whether the haptics for the uh for the yamane technique or pvda for polypropylene uh, you know polypropylene haptics and uh, then you know you probably uh, uh, you know shignesh uh, we uh, how much of the haptic is ideal to be kind of you know made into the flange these two questions yeah uh, ideally uh, just about 1 mm so that you get a nice uh, it should not be too thick also mm-hmm. so don't over cauterize but it should be adequate so that it does not slip through the tunnel so just about 1 mm uh, you can cauterize and Uh, if you use the sensor it is pmma so pmma is better pvdf also can be used uh, the uh, polypropylene can also be used but i think uh, the commonest uh, i have maximum uh, use the uh, sensor three piece lenses and uh, they are pmma i use the alcon is there anything uh, to choose between them like why would you uh, what are the benefits or pros and cons alcon, of using one over the I've, other yeah alcon uh, the haptics are a little more brittle and they have a tendency to break when you maneuver them especially with the forceps so i'm not very comfortable i tried a couple of alcon lenses i had breakages uh, so i stopped uh, i i feel the 
sensor three piece is uh, kind of ideal in our situation. The other lenses which Yamane uses uh, are not available in uh, India. The Aron lens and the uh, the other one more which you use is uh, they are not available as yet in India. They are six point five mm uh, optics. Uh, maybe better for centration. But uh, the other thing I want to make clear, whether it is Yamane, glue dye well, uh, suture fixated scleral, or the uh, dumbbell four flange technique, it is very important to remove all the capsular bag remnants. So do a thorough vitrectomy. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have small pupils you are not able to see. Then it is better to use iris hooks, retract, remove the remnants of the bag. Because if the bag remnants are there, then you have a higher chance of tilt and uh, decentration. So if you have removed all the capsular bag uh, remnants and done a good vitrectomy, uh, so that is something which uh, is ideal. Most of these techniques are even done by the VR surgeons. In fact, Yemeni also does uh, VR surgery and uh, that's how he kind of started this technique. So a lot of the VR surgeons do uh, a scleral fixation and secondary IVs. Yes. And most of the anterior segment surgeons do iris fixation because it's yes. <laughs> very easy. But Scleral, the scleral techniques are uh, good. They have their advantages. Mm. Um, no doubt. I think we've got a long record, long track yeah. record for you know almost ten years of fixating to the sclera. Unlike uh, you know even uh, my thesis, uh, twenty five years back, twenty years back was on scleral fixation with you know mercilline and polypropylene sutures. So it's long way that we've come, but uh, lots of new things. I have a quick question again. Any caution on choosing the right needle? Because you know I think when a person starts off with his surgery, it's so important to have like the sharpness and the quality and the bore and like, would you want to kind of try it out before outside before, you know, whether your haptic is getting captured? Because I know of some surgeons who have, you know, started it and aborted it because they went wrong with the needle and the passage of the needle and everything. See, what Yemeni uses is the TSK thin walled, ultra thin walled uh, 30 gauge needle. Mm -hmm. So these uh, 30 gauge needle is ideal for Aron lenses and the other lenses he uses. But the 30 gauge needle thin walled with the sensor is a little difficult. If, we, if you are perfectly perpendicular, you may just be able to get a very snug fit. But inside the eye, it's a little difficult to manage. So my suggestion is, if you're using a sensor three-piece, use the 27-gauge BD needle. It works beautifully, and that's what I, I use. You'll also have to see that the needle is sharp, and also you bend it correctly, um, and then pass it, uh, how you pass it in, intrasclerally. And again, don't distort the haptics. If you distort the haptics, then it becomes uh, very difficult. You can have uh, breakage or you can have uh, uh, a decentration and it becomes uh, difficult. So these are things that you have to take care of. So that's why it's a technically a little more difficult. Whereas the four flanks, the dumbbell technique is very easy to perform. Even residents can do it and you invariably don't get any decentration or tilt. But there, the two things that you have to take care of, don't see that the sutures don't cross. Otherwise, if they get entangled, then it's difficult. Then the other thing is the suture should not be loose. If it is loose and you cauterize, again, you can have a tilt and decentration. So you'll have to pull up the suture firmly and then uh, cauterize it. The other thing is, like I said, do a thorough vitrectomy and see that there are no capsular bag remnants when doing this procedure. Fantastic. I have, I think I've run out of questions. You've answered so many uh, questions now that uh, if Dr. Sheetal has any, I've really thoroughly enjoyed myself, uh, you know, seeing all your videos and so much learning for me as well. And I'm sure the audience has enjoyed it. And we've had huge number of questions asked. So Dr. Sheetal, uh, if you have anything, otherwise, um, you know. Uh, Dr. Ravi has asked, uh, where are these PMMA lenses with eyelets available in India? Uh, they are available with all companies. Uh, I use the biotech lenses. Uh, they are available from biotech. They are available from IOCare. They are available with Orolab. They are available with Apasami. So I, almost all companies uh, have uh, scleral fixated uh, lenses with pilots. A lot of people are quite asking. inexpensive. It is available on YouTube because uh, they want to see it again. Yes. Yes. It. My my uh, videos are available on YouTube and. Uh, uh, you can webinar, see them. This webinar series. Is webinar also will be available on uh, YouTube, and yeah. uh, you can. Uh, I think. Uh, I think uh, Ganesh, you should upload this to your Netadhama YouTube channel, which already has a lot of nice videos. So I suggest that you know by tomorrow morning, ask your IT team to please uh, you know put up this on YouTube, your channel. I'm sure a lot of people are going to hear about this webinar and try to find it somewhere. 
make sure that it's available both on facebook uh, channel of nitya dhama and the youtube channel it will be very useful for many people who are beginning to uh, learn these yes, new techniques we'll do that we'll do that it will be available uh, by probably tomorrow evening we'll make it available on our facebook and also on the uh, on our youtube channel nitya dhama youtube channel great so i think uh, we should conclude we have run out of time I know we've really gone beyond. You should run a fellowship on these uh, techniques, uh, Ganesh. I'm uh, suggesting for so many people who would like to learn, you can have short one or two months, uh, you know, kind of observership or fellowship to learn these newer techniques. Uh, yes, it's very great. important because sometimes uh, you also get into complications. You can have uh, runoffs, and then you don't have a, a proper bag, so you can't put the lens in the bag. You don't have adequate support to put it in the sulcus, and then you have to know one of these techniques. to manage the patient so it's very important that you know these techniques and start practicing and learn the nuances of uh, doing it so thank you all uh, very much and uh, i hope you enjoyed this uh, session uh, i enjoyed uh, teaching you yeah, all uh, thank you elorgan pharmaceuticals for supporting us for this webinar and Great. thank you thank guys you, thank you dr gaurav for Thanks. your precious time and all uh, the wonderful discussions and uh, uh, i'm sure the whole audience has benefited a lot thanks for thank inviting you. me thank and uh, great yeah. great seeing you all and thanks to alargan thanks thank you thank you alargan thank you gaurav and uh, dr and Shikha. all our viewers as well yeah and uh, viewers <laughs> good evening you. and have bye a nice bye. Bye. evening thank you bye